The King's Muse The couch on which Alexis was sitting was cushioned and soft. It sank with a soft squeak when she sat down. But no matter how comfortable it was, she was far from being comfortable, as she was half-clothed. The maid only spoke to her when she was told by the king to do so, and after giving a few instructions to Alexis, she was ushered out of the room, leaving King Nicholas and Alexis alone. Alexis had turned her body while covering as much of herself as she could with her hands. If one day the wicked king were to die, it would be because she had stabbed him, but then that was only in her imagination. Alexis soon heard footsteps coming back to the gallery, but she didn't turn to look at Nicholas. The king himself had merely glanced at her before he went toward the far wall to pick up another easel and a fresh piece of canvas. Positioning the canvas, he started to bring out the paints and the palette, getting them ready. How are you feeling? She heard Nicholas ask. Mortified and angry, she said as she gritted her teeth, not hiding the discomfort he had placed her in. That's good. Next time you try to lie to me, remember this. Nicholas said without looking at her, while he stood in one corner of the room, mixing the colors. Alexis wanted to know if Nicholas had ever been punished for his actions, but at the same time, she had to remind herself that he was the king. The king made and broke the rules. He was the exception to the rules. While Nicholas was doing something with his palate, Alexis continued to sit on the couch, unmoving, like a statue. She tried to calm herself as she knew that anger would only feed into the twisted mind of the vampire king. To most, her actions would appear to be irrational after all. Girls were often married off to the lords, dukes, kings, and other men who held a closer seat to the king. Therefore, it was nothing new. Women had been treated as property for centuries. Marriages were often formed to create alliances, or for peace, but rarely out of love. Girls even younger than her were forced into marrying the men, forced into bed, and thinking this, Alexis closed her eyes. She came to realize the difference between those girls and her was that they were married to those men immediately, while she was only being held captive waiting to be wed. And as the thought sank in, she tried to think things over, but it didn't stop her from seeking the freedom that she cherished. Nicholas left the pallet near the easel and walked toward Alexis, his eyes darker than before, and she didn't know if it was because of the light-colored shirt he wore, which accentuated his eyes. Have you painted people before? asked Alexis, who had been holding her breath and now had to remind herself to breathe. I have, he replied, reaching for her ankle and yanking it so her leg stretched across the couch. Both men and women. Men, too? came out Alexis's honest question. She couldn't picture a naked man being painted by Nicholas. Nicholas's eyes tried to meet hers but she wasn't looking at him. When it comes to art, there's no man or woman. But if it helps, men are often drawn with women. Alexis had only been curious about it. Aren't you uncomfortable sitting like that? He asked, noticing how she had twisted the top half of her body. I'm uncomfortable wearing just a petticoat, she muttered under her breath. If it's uncomfortable, we can take it off to make you feel more comfortable, he said softly, making Alexis's eyes go wide, and she whipped her head around to look at him. When his hand reached close to her shoulder, Alexis froze. I'm fine, she said, not knowing why she even tried to wriggle her way out of his grasp. 
she saw how Nicholas smiled. The smile was slow and gradual, starting with his eyes and spreading to his lips. His eyes were filled with mirth, knowing he had her just where he wanted her, here with him. Let me know if you find something to be uncomfortable. I'll be sure to help you. Meaning to make it worse, thought Alexis, staring at him as she felt him pull strands of her hair and then push them back. All right? He asked, waiting for her reply. Okay, she answered. This was as if she were drowning, but she would have to flail her arms by herself because asking for help from him would be like being pushed deeper underwater. Nicholas left her side and walked back to the canvas. Relax, Alexis, she heard him say. I'll capture what you show me, and I'll take what you give me. There was promise in those words, and Alexis tore her gaze away from him to look at one of the paintings hanging on the wall. She wanted to glare, but at the same time, she didn't want to look at him. Nicholas, standing behind the canvas, was tall enough that he didn't have to step away to take a look at Alexis, as he could see her perfectly from where he stood. She looked delectable sitting like that. Painting came a second nature to him, and he was used to people's naked bodies. But with Alexis, it was different. It wasn't the nakedness that was so alluring to his eyes, but the way she looked right now, trying to preserve her modesty, which he had seen when he had dressed her before. He was used to women showing off their assets, trying to lure him, but they were nothing but objects to be drawn. He wondered why, even though Alexis was dressed only in her petticoat, she appeared to be the most beautiful girl he'd ever seen a work of art that he didn't want only to capture on his canvas, but to capture her in his arms. She looked even better than he'd imagined, with her pale skin, red cheeks, and pale pink lips that were parted. While her eyes had been lowered, she was almost too perfect. Alexis didn't know how long she would have to sit here like this. As Nicholas had pointed out earlier, the position she had opted for started to turn one of her legs numb, and her back began to ache. But she didn't complain. Alexis had her own pride, and she wouldn't admit defeat when it came to Nicholas. Within the space she and the king shared, she could hear the strokes of the pencil against the canvas. The minutes ticked away and soon added up to an hour, as Alexis had lost track of time. All the while, she could feel Nicholas's eyes on her, and neither of them spoke. She sat there on the couch while he continued to draw her. She didn't know when it happened. As she started to feel drowsy after it seemed like hours had passed, but her body swayed slightly, and her eyes finally closed as she fell asleep on the couch. Nicholas who had been outlining her with the charcoal, shifted his gaze to look up from the canvas to find the girl asleep on the couch. One hand was placed under the side of her head, and the other one rested on the cushions of the couch. His red eyes stared at her, leaving the canvas he was working on behind as he walked over to the couch and sat on the floor in front of it, his face close to hers. Alexis looked defenseless, yet beautiful as she slept. Are you trying to make me fall for you even more? He asked in a whisper that didn't reach Alexis, as she was asleep. Nicholas then stood up, walking back to replace the canvas with a new one, restarting the art that was in front of his eyes that was so precious, which was the girl who was sleeping on the couch. A Mysterious Painting Alexis was the kind of art Nicholas could draw thousands of times without getting tired. For someone who had kept her guard up since the time she had come to know who he was, 
Alexis was now sound asleep on the couch, defenseless and vulnerable, completely delusional about the dangers of the castle or the king. Nicholas took his time in drawing every line and curve as the girl continued to sleep in the quiet room. His red eyes moved between the canvas and his muse, unable to keep his eyes off her, where for once she wasn't glaring at him. He stopped his hand from moving on the canvas, his feet padded on the ground to where she was, the piece of charcoal turning to dust because of the pressure of his fingers, and fine black particles fell on the floor. Alexis had somehow curled herself up on the couch, and it made Nicholas wonder if she hadn't been sleeping well at night. It could also be because of the exhausting day, and the thought itself made Nicholas angry. His jaw clenched at the notion that the man had come here to meet her. He was no fool to believe that it was a coincidence. Were you hoping to leave today with him? He asked in a whisper, his eyes taking in her sleeping form. You looked anxious when you met me. What did you do with him? I won't let anyone take you away from me. When Alexis turned over slightly to find a more comfortable position to sleep in, the unconscious girl didn't know she was only enticing the king further with her current state. Alexis had gone to sleep facing the ceiling, with one hand placed on her stomach, and the other resting on the surface of the couch next to her. The petticoat wasn't a long one, but of a length that reached just below her knee, which now had raised itself to show the pale, lace-like garters around one of her thighs. The hand that lay on her stomach pushed on the upper part of her petticoat to show the curve and color of her fingernails because of the fabric pressing against her body. Nicholas's hands itched to touch the peaceful girl in front of him. He clenched his fists, his eyes turning darker than before when his eyes fell on it. His anger hadn't dissipated, not because the man had come to the castle, but because of the lie Alexis had told him. He couldn't let it pass, and it appeared that the girl had forgotten the point of the punishment. He wasn't a king-king. Alexis. He called her name loud enough to watch her eyes snap open with surprise. I didn't know I asked you to sleep while I was painting you. Nicholas's words were sharp, and his eyes even more intimidating, as if he was upset about something. Did I? he demanded. In her haste to awaken, she didn't realize that the petticoat had moved from the top of her shoulder, leaving one side covered up to her neck, and the other one exposed, giving him a view of her smooth, bare shoulder. Once she noticed, she was about to make it right, but Nicholas had gotten to it sooner, as he took hold of one end of the petticoat from where her skin was showing and pulled it back into place. Alexis had tried to keep herself awake, but her eyes kept closing, so she decided to close them for a few seconds, but she had actually fallen asleep in this man's presence. You must be stressed thinking of that man and getting him caught in the castle, Nicholas said straightening both the sides of the petticoat, even as Alexis wished he would let them go, but he didn't. This is why they say not to lie and to come clean. I probably should have had you with the bedsheet to paint. It would have kept you awake, he taunted. Alexis moved farther back into the couch where she was sitting, only to see him take his hand away. Seeing her still drowsy as she was trying to wake up fully, Nicholas kept up his teasing. Anyway, I got the painting I was hoping for. I didn't know you could have such a sensual look on your face while sleeping, not to forget where your hands and legs were. His words were slow and deliberate, so that every one of them would sink into her mind. Nicholas's eyes shone with an evil look, 
and Alexis could feel her heart drop in dread. It was way better than I imagined. And he looked downward, from her neck suggestively, as Alexis crossed her arms in front of her. Seeing him stand up and turn around to go back to the canvas, Alexis's lips pursed. The way he spoke, in the way her petticoat had risen up her thigh, she didn't know what he had painted. Can I see it? She asked, curious to confirm her suspicion about what outrageous painting he had made of her. No, the king said in a dry tone. No, thought Alexis to herself. Nicholas's reply was quick and short, giving no explanation of why she couldn't see it when she was the one he had painted. She then realized she had used polite speech with her question. Changing her tone, she said, I want to see it. And this earned her a look from Nicholas, who turned around to meet her eyes. You want to see it? He said, cocking his head to the side. The way he asked her, Alexis wasn't sure if she was supposed to nod her head or not. Yes? Alexis tried to search through his demeanor to see if this was a trap or if he would allow her, because the first time she had asked, he had refused. That's what I thought, Nicholas replied, noticing how she was fretting to see what he had drawn with her in it. He relished the anxious look that he had brought out on her face. Seeing Alexis stand up, Nicholas stepped slowly toward her. For someone who fell asleep in front of the king, give me one reason why I shouldn't punish you further. He walked around, pausing behind her. Were you expecting me to hand down another punishment to you? He asked his words falling right next to her ears. You know what? You can go back to your room. Alexis would have been relieved that he was dismissing her from his presence, but she was clad only in a petticoat, and the dress she had been wearing was nowhere to be seen in the room. Was he purposely asking her to leave the room in this state? When her eyes met Nicholas's, she saw him grinning at her. Covered in a coat. Where are my clothes? Alexis inquired, her gaze breaking away from him to search the room. But it seemed that the dress she had been wearing had disappeared in the thin air. On your body? Came the king's nonchalant answer. He knew what she was talking about but he played innocent. The dress that I was wearing earlier, before you asked me to be your muse, she elaborated, trying to keep herself as patient as possible. That one? It got dirty because of the paint. I had it taken away to be cleaned. He replied as if it was nothing. He playfully pushed her buttons, watching her struggle to keep her composure. She opened her mouth, then suddenly closed it. Nicholas had tried to rile up her emotions, and it seemed that it had worked when he had mentioned painting her provocatively, explaining about her body, and looking at her suggestively. I can't leave the gallery like this, Alexis protested. No sane woman would step out in the open for others to see her in nothing but a petticoat and stockings. It would give the wrong impression of her, especially when she was with the king. People would get the wrong idea. Like what? He breathed the words and placed something in his pocket. That something transpired between us. Let them, came his quick reply, as if he didn't care about it. His hand reached her face, his thumb running across her bottom lip. The only person you should care about is me, and not what others think. A shiver ran down her body when he spoke to her, as his thumb gently brushed her lip, and then he smiled. Nicholas's hand slipped away from her lips, and he walked to the other side of the room, 
picking up the coat he had been wearing earlier and hung it up. Returning, he put the coat around her shoulders. It was so big that it practically swallowed her and reached just above the hem of her petticoat. Alexis had a look of surprise when he was done putting the coat on her. Better? He asked before lowering his voice. Go on, before the big bad wolf gobbles you up in this empty room, where no one else is. Nicholas had been angry a few hours ago, and now he was being gentle with her, even though it was his fault that she was basically undressed at the moment. She didn't know how she would be able to make it to her room in this state, but she took what she was given. She knew better than to be told twice, so she rushed to leave the gallery. Alexis clutched the coat that was around her tightly, making sure that it covered enough of her body. On her way, she met the king's right-hand man, Paul, who was coming from the other end of the corridor. She continued to walk without stopping to talk to him. He had informed Nicholas about James, even though he said he wouldn't. If she knew this was going to happen, she would have... She didn't know what she would do, but at least she wouldn't be wearing almost nothing. As they passed each other, Paul didn't stop either, and Alexis continued to walk until she reached her room. Stepping inside, she closed the door. Back in the gallery, Nicholas was covering the canvas he had worked on before cleaning his hands with a wet cloth, as they were covered in charcoal and paint, when Paul arrived at the door. The man bowed his head to hear the king speak. Where does your loyalty lie, Paul? He asked slowly. Paul, who had raised his head, looked at Nicholas, who glanced at him before throwing the wet cloth on the floor. It lies with you, my king, he said, bowing his head. Then is there a reason why you didn't tell me you saw that low life in the castle? Nicholas said, raising an eyebrow. He picked up the covered canvas and turned it to face the wall. I didn't see them talking to each other, my lord, answered Paul, which was the truth. Paul wasn't someone who missed things, and if his eyes were on the girl, it meant he would find out the truth. If I didn't know better, I'd think that you've taken a liking toward the girl. But I know that wasn't your intention, said Nicholas turning around to meet Paul's eyes. Thinking quickly, Paul said, I apologize, my lord. I thought you would have him killed, and it would strain the relationship that you're building with her. Also, I thought you would notice it. I didn't mean any harm. It won't happen again. Of course you didn't. If you did, we wouldn't be standing here now, would we? The king's lips twisted into a smile. He had known Paul since they were young boys. Therefore, if there was anyone whom he trusted, it was the man who stood in front of him. Nicholas didn't want anyone else coveting Alexis, because to him, she was already his. Ever since the first time his eyes had fallen on her in the ballroom. He wasn't someone who cared about little things like rumors. Even if they did spread around the castle... They would only solidify the words that were relayed to the servants and ministers there. Did you have a good time? asked Paul, as Nicholas had made sure no one would disturb his time with Alexis. Nicholas ran his fingers through his thick locks of black hair and said, A wonderfully torturous one. It was too hard not to touch her. He wanted to give her time to ease into castle life, but he lacked patience. All he wanted to do was take her in his arms and treat her the way he wanted to, to not let her out of his bed. Paul didn't know what that meant, but if he wasn't sending people to fetch the man who had come to meet the lady at the castle, he thought that the king was in a good mood. But he thought wrong, as he discovered the next moment when he heard Nicholas say, 
Call in the tailor man. Tell him the ministers need new clothes. Crowded Memories Paul had spent many years with Nicholas, and he knew the man not only because he was king, but because he was his friend. Nicholas's right-hand man had nothing but his best interests in mind when it came to the one who wore the crown. You stopped painting, said Nicholas, leaning back against the table to support himself while looking at Paul, who was looking at one of the many paintings Nicholas had made. I lost interest in it a long time ago. I don't think I have it in me to paint any more, answered Paul. He went to look at the same painting Alexis had come to stand and stare at earlier, the image of the crowded market that was dark and yet bustling with people. He felt it was too crowded, with so many things in it, and said, I don't have the talent like you, my king. Nicholas looked at Paul, who was staring at the painting before he tore his gaze away and regarded him with a smile. Maybe this is why you're the rightful person to have the crown on your head. I'm not strong enough to relive the memories. Those memories are what has made us who we are today, replied Nicholas. He pushed himself from the table and came over to study the painting. Those were some memories, said the king, whose lips pulled up from one corner, his eyes assessing what he had created. Do you ever dream of it, sir? asked Paul, his lighter red eyes gazing at Nicholas. Every time I close my eyes, you live the dream to the point where it doesn't affect you anymore. It's just a numb feeling that eventually comes to pass, or stay. Nicholas and Paul weren't related to each other, but they had met when they were young boys, having each other's back in the world in which they lived where it was survival of the fittest. Paul went down on one knee, his head bowed to express his gratitude to the king. I owe you my life. I'm at your service at any time, he said quietly. Nicholas stared at Paul and said, I'll be wise to use it when I deem it to be fit. And when Paul stood up, he asked, what did you find about the poison that's been discovered? So far, the servants appear to know nothing about it. Oswin hasn't answered the questions that he's been asked. But he fears for his life and his family. Paul said as they made their way out of the gallery room. He seems to be hiding something, but refuses to speak about it, especially with him in the solitary room. The king smiled grimly as he said, well, he's not getting out of there any time soon, if that's the case. Redouble your efforts to loosen his tongue. We must know the source of that poison. Yes, my lord. Paul agreed, acknowledging Nicholas's command. As they continued to walk, they were surprised to see one of the king's relatives walking toward them. Cousin Arya Wilmond had arrived. What is she doing here? asked Nicholas, with a bright smile on his face. Her ankle must have gotten better, replied Paul, looking at the vampire headed their way. Nicholas couldn't help but smile over his response, because they both knew Arya hadn't really hurt her ankle, and that it had been nothing but a ploy to get his attention. The two men had grown up in the worst part of the land, and it was easy for them to recognize such white lies. Arya had a look of distress on her face as she approached them. When she was close, she smiled at the king. Cousin Nicholas, she said, bowing her head and lifting it. Arya? Nicholas greeted her. I didn't know you were visiting the castle. How's your ankle? He asked politely, his eyes filled with mirth as he looked at her. Arya gave him a warm smile. It's much better now, thank you for asking, she said, looking down to her leg and bringing her foot forward, rotating her ankle to show that it had healed. 
I thought it was your left ankle that had twisted itself, Nicholas stated, and Arya looked as if she had been caught before she smiled. Is that so? This was the ankle, Cousin Nicholas, answered Arya. Her eyes moved to his shirt, which was dotted with spots of paint. He wore a pale white shirt with the top two buttons left unfastened to let one have a view of his smooth, hard chest. The vampiress would have blushed and acted coy in front of Nicholas if she hadn't seen the lowly human wearing a coat that belonged to the king. She had reached the castle three hours ago and had been wanting to meet Nicholas, but the ministers and the servants had mentioned that he was in his room, resting, which was a lie. Earlier, Arya had stepped out of her guest room and walked toward the king's quarters so that she could talk to him. It was then that she had noticed the human walking in one of the corridors, some distance from where she stood. She and her mother had dropped her off well away from the castle, so that she would never return. So how did she come back? The human clearly lacked a proper dress underneath the coat that belonged to the king. Arya was furious when she saw her enter a room and close the door behind her, had the king bedded her? She was curious. I wonder which of our memories is bad, hummed Nicholas, a hint of sarcasm in it. Unless you are implying that mine is bad. Arya laughed softly, placing her hand on Nicholas's arm. Stop teasing me, cousin Nicholas. Paul, who was with them, turned away looking at the walls and pillars of the castle, when he heard Nicholas say, Am I? Paul, huh. do you agree with Lady Arya's statement? The vampire pushed his glasses up to the bridge of his nose, replying, You have an excellent memory, my king. No one else can compare to it. Paul was the king's most trusted and loyal subject, who would swear that black was white, if the king asked him to testify to it. You need to eat almonds. They say that's good to retain memory, said Nicholas, and Arya wondered how she could have made the error of forgetting which ankle she had shown to have hurt before. When they started to walk, Arya stayed right next to Nicholas's side. Though young, she was a vampiress who was looking forward to becoming the queen of these lands, and she had grown up with the thought of how she should behave and influence people. And maybe it would have been easy if the king wasn't Nicholas, but another man instead. She didn't know how, but Arya had noticed many times how he was able to look through her or anyone else which was why she had to be careful with what she said to him. Were you painting? asked Arya with an enthusiastic voice. Nicholas nodded to her. I was. Can I see it later? It's been a while since I last went to the gallery. The last I saw was you working on the stag that we hunted. My king, I have a request, said Arya her red eyes looking into his darker ones. I would like to be painted, too. Her words slow enough so that their meaning wouldn't be lost. Dismissing Arya's Request After hearing Arya's request, Nicholas let out a chuckle. Taking her words literally, he said, I don't think you'd need me for that, Arya. The paints are there in the room. Just pick up a can and pour it on yourself. For the first two seconds, Arya blinked and looked at Nicholas, waiting for him to say something more. When he didn't, she laughed nervously again, her hand on Nicholas's arm. That's so mean, Cousin Nicholas. You're always teasing me, Arya said, pouting. I can't help but want to tease you. He replied, smiling at her, and she returned the smile. Nicholas and Arya were treating each other nicely for their purposes, 
If it had been someone else who had the audacity to speak about her having to pour paints on herself, she wouldn't have hesitated in slapping the person who tried to make a joke. But Nicholas was no regular person. He was the king, and if she was going to be his queen one day, she would have to stay in his good graces. Not to forget, Nicholas had his own charm. Every word he uttered was mesmerizing, enough that she didn't like it when he paid attention to other girls. She wondered if Nicholas had done something to the human that had her walking around in such a state. When Nicholas's eyes met Paul's, a quiet stare passed between them. Paul took it upon himself to ask, Lady Aria, shall I have a room prepared for you if you're staying here tonight? That won't be necessary. I already asked one of the servants to get me a room. Aria didn't look at Paul as she spoke, but glanced at Nicholas with a smile on her face. But when I asked for the room, I was assigned to one of the guest rooms of the castle. Isn't that where guests stay? Unless you're asking to share my room. Nicholas raised his eyebrows. How scandalous. Hearing him say those words, which were what her heart and mind truly desired, Arya couldn't help but blush. Like most women, she wasn't immune to Nicholas's charm. And at the end of the day... Arya was just another girl who was trying to win his approval, showing him how much she respected him and did things he wanted her to do. That's not what I meant, Arya exclaimed. She quickly covered it up by saying, I'm your cousin. It's just strange I'm being put in a guest room and not in the royal quarters. I've never gotten to stay there even once. Nicholas gazed knowingly at Arya, a subtle smile still on his lips. The king's quarters are only for the king. Did you see something you weren't supposed to see, Arya? He asked. Arya shook her head. Thank you for looking after me, Cousin Nicholas. She thanked him before asking him, Where's Alexis? Lady Alexis, corrected Nicholas and Arya felt a jab in her chest. She's possibly in her room, resting now. You can talk to her once she comes down for dinner. Resting? Is she all right? Asked Arya, feigning concern that wasn't how she truly felt. She's fine. Where's your mother? She'll be upset if she sees you hanging out with men, especially when you've yet to find a suitable man and settle down. How are your suitors? Asked Nicholas, turning the question back on her. I don't think there's anyone among them who's worthy of me so far. I thought perhaps I should join the court. Maybe I'll find someone there. What do you think? Asked Arya, speaking indirectly as usual. Suit yourself? Nicholas replied with a bright smile and a sparkle in his dark red eyes. Paul merely glanced away without being too obvious, keeping his words and thoughts to himself. Back in her room, Alexis had removed the king's coat and started to change into something much more decent than what she was wearing for the last few hours in the gallery. Until she had reached her room, she had tried to hide her face behind her blonde hair, but that had only brought more attention to her if the word were to spread about how she had been barely clothed in front of the king, her modesty would be lost. When a woman was associated with a man who wasn't her husband, it was always the woman who had to suffer the burn of the criticism. People were harsh, and they called women names that were hard to bear. Here, Alexis was dealing with the king, and everyone knew the kind of debauchery that occurred when it involved a man of such high status. She had pulled off her petticoat, and she was about to put a new one on when she noticed her thighs and the stockings that came up past her knees. One of the lacy garters she used to hold up her stockings was missing. Her eyebrows rose in astonishment, 
and she looked around the room where she had walked to see if it had fallen off. Had she lost it on her way from the gallery to the room, or had it come loose to slip off and fall in the gallery without her notice? She finally dressed and stayed in the room until she was called by the maid to join the king in the dining room. Nicholas had created enough anxiety in her by looking at her suggestively in the gallery and telling her that he had painted her while she had fallen asleep. When Alexis had woken up from her nap on the couch, the hem of her dress had come up, and God only knew what the crazy king had painted or drawn of her. Reaching the dining room, Alexis was greeted by the sight of Arya sitting at the table with Nicholas. Lady Alexis, how are you doing? asked Arya, looking at her. I heard you were resting in your room. I'm doing well, Alexis replied, staring at Arya. The last time she had seen the girl was when she and her family had ordered her to get out of their carriage in the middle of the forest. That's good to hear. I was worried whether you made it safely after you asked to stop the carriage in the forest. Arya was a smart girl, who had subtly pushed the blame onto Alexis so that she wouldn't be questioned. Come sit here, she said, patting her hand enthusiastically on the chair next to her. Before Alexis could move, she heard Nicholas say, Your seat is here. As he pulled out the chair next to him, his eyes on hers. Cautiously, she went to that seat which was pulled out farther by the maid, and she sat down next to him. Arya was seated right in front of her, and though Alexis was looking at all the fine food on the table, she could feel the glare coming from across the table. Spitting Lies if only the Wilmots had dropped Alexis off at the closest town or village, she wouldn't have to be sitting in the castle. The vampiress Arya couldn't stop thinking about how Alexis had come to stay at the castle again. When her mother had agreed to stop the carriage in the woods and drop off the human, it had brought immense pleasure to her heart and mind. Looking at the girl, whose look of distress had made her laugh, she knew she still would have been laughing if the girl weren't here in the same room. How did she manage to get back to the castle? Arya couldn't help but glare at Alexis at every opportunity she found when Nicholas wasn't looking her way. And she knew Alexis could sense her gaze from across the table, as it appeared that she was trying not to look at her. But she wanted to know about Alexis. The king had taken an interest in her, which had come to Arya's attention. How did you get back to the castle? She asked. I was worried when you asked us to stop in the middle of the forest, and it's such a relief that you're all right. Cousin Nicholas, I hope you aren't upset with me. She seemed to be asking for forgiveness, but Alexis wondered what Arya really meant. The king, who had been enjoying his meal, looked up at Arya, appearing utterly oblivious to what she was saying. I don't know why I would be upset with you, he said, smiling at the young vampiress, and this had Alexis confused. Lady Alexis must have wanted to visit the town first, but she changed her mind and wished to stop the carriage so that she could get out, said Arya, a concerned look on her face. Did she? asked Nicholas with apparent fake surprise, and he looked at Alexis. Is that so? he asked testingly, even though he had heard Alexis's version of the story. Alexis wished just then that she could throw her glass of water at the vampires, but she doubted if she would be satisfied with just water being thrown. This vampires was playing the king, and Nicholas was humoring her. Having both Arya's as well as Nicholas's eyes on her, Alexis took a deep breath and said, Yes, I wanted to take a walk in the forest. 
I thought I could find some rabbits and serve them to you. Alexis spoke politely and had always been a respectful girl, so it wasn't in her nature to twist words. Yes, came the clipped answer with a smile on Arya's lips. When her red eyes met Alexis's brown ones, the smile grew. And she then asked, Did you find the rabbits? You should probably join us when we go hunting. Cousin Nicholas never misses his mark. He's excellent. But Arya's flattery missed its mark, as the king didn't heed her words of praise. I don't think Alexis is ready for such hunts yet. Nicholas replied, before picking up a piece of meat that he placed on Alexis's plate. Try this, he urged, and he went back to eating to leave Arya's mouth agape. Alexis didn't react to any of it and quietly ate her food along with the meat Nicholas had put on her plate. She then heard Arya say, Cousin Nicholas, why are you cutting the meat and putting it on Lady Alexis's plate? If you want to get rid of the scraps that you don't want to eat, you can put them here. Arya picked up a clean plate and placed it in between them. Alexis stopped using her knife and fork, and she looked across the table into Arya's eyes, which seemed rather pleased. Nicholas chuckled at Arya's offer. Alexis isn't a night creature like us to eat the barely cooked meat. The sides of the meat are better cooked, and would be easier for her to consume rather than trying to eat the uncooked meat, was his response. Alexis was unhappy that she was being caged in this castle, but she felt compelled to give Nicholas a look of appreciation for the way he answered Arya. He was being considerate by looking over what she was eating, while also making sure she wasn't uncomfortable or repulsed by the food that was being served to her. Thank you, she murmured. It went unheard by Arya, but Nicholas, who was looking at his cousin, smiled. Not for Arya, but to hear Alexis thank him without his having to push her for those words of gratitude. That's considerate of you, Cousin Nicholas, said Arya, switching sides quickly from insulting to praising. Lady Alexis, she added, and Alexis knew something was waiting ahead of her. I think we should share a room so that we can talk. I never had a sister of my own, and some of my cousins. Now that Arya had seen Alexis enter one of the rooms in the king's quarters, she wanted the human out of there. When she, the cousin of the king, wasn't allowed to occupy a place anywhere close to the king, she didn't see any reason why Alexis should have such a privilege. The young vampiress then turned to the king to ask, what do you think, Cousin Nicholas, about Lady Alexis sharing a room with me? Nicholas had just reached for his glass of wine, and he didn't hesitate to take a sip from it as Arya asked. After putting the glass down, he smiled sweetly and said, It would be better if she used the same room alone. I wouldn't want to worry whether you might suck her dry when she's fast asleep or help her escape from the castle like last time. Arya didn't utter another word, as it seemed like Nicholas had an inkling of what had happened. When they finished their meal, Alexis said, If you'll all excuse me, I'll be taking my leave now. But Nicholas wasn't having any of it. Stay, came the order from the king. Alexis pursed her lips. I think I dropped my kerchief back in the gallery, she said, not wanting to say that the garter around her thigh had been lost. Arya was ready to dismiss the girl, but then Nicholas was quick to say, Let us help you look for it. Number of Tailors Even Arya was with Alexis on this, as she wanted to get rid of the human and keep her away from Nicholas, so that she could speak and spend more time with him. But with Alexis around them, the king was distracted. 
If Lady Alexis is insisting on going alone, I think it should be fine. Surely she wouldn't be able to run away if that's what you're worried about, Cousin Nicholas. Arya said, her words coming out sweet and polite, as if she meant no harm to anyone. Rubbish, said Nicholas, who had stepped in front of Alexis. It would be rude to let a lady go by herself without someone accompanying her, especially when it's such a pretty one. At a subtle compliment, Alexis looked into his red eyes as he stared at her. She wasn't going to run away from the castle at this hour of the night. She also wasn't an idiot to try again in less than a week. If they were going to come along with her, she couldn't tell them that what she had lost or dropped wasn't a mere handkerchief, but in truth, a lacy garter. I insist. Nicholas was persistent, as if he knew there was a speck of lie in the words she had spoken. Come, Arya, let's accompany Lady Alexis. Now that Nicholas had already decided, Arya had no other choice but to oblige, and she nodded. Alexis clutched the edges of her dress before giving them a nod. All right, she said bowing her head to appreciate his kind gesture, even though she didn't want it. All she would have to do was find the garter first and exchange it with a handkerchief so that everything would look normal. And so did the three of them leave the dining room and walk toward the gallery, which was where Alexis assumed she would find the lost item. As the night had fallen, the corridors of the castle were lit with the help of lanterns, leaving a golden glow on the walls and floors. On their way, Arya said, If it's a kerchief, you can make use of the other ones that are in the room, or maybe one of the servants will find it and return it to you. The vampirus had a valid point here. Arya's right, Nicholas said agreeing with his cousin. I can summon the tailor to sew and make new, tailored kerchiefs to your liking. Would you like that? Alexis's eyes turned wide when Nicholas mentioned the tailor. She turned to look at Nicholas, who had no smile on his face, but was looking down the corridor in front of them. How many tailors did the king have? Maybe there was more than one and the person Nicholas had spoken of was someone else who wasn't James. But then, Alexis didn't know how petty the king could be. Did I say something wrong? Nicholas asked her. Though Alexis wanted to say yes, that would only prompt further conversation, rather than her being vague about the matter. Arya then said, Cousin Nicholas is always right. Why are we looking for one handkerchief when you can have ten or twenty of them? She then looked at Alexis by quickly taking two steps forward to say, I think Lady Alexis sometimes forgets that this isn't her village where people only have one handkerchief with them. But this is, in fact, the castle. No need to be like that, Arya. Alexis will slowly learn to accustom herself to the castle life. After all, she'll be the future queen of this castle. Nicholas's words were like a slap in Arya's face, and for several seconds, she was shocked by how firm the king was in his decision. It's barely been a few days. She'll turn into a fine lady. Neither girl said anything and as they continued to walk toward the gallery, it was Alexis who had started to look for the piece of fabric. Arya was furious at the thought that Nicholas was planning to turn this lowly human, who knew nothing about their world, into his queen. She was the rightful person to be seated next to Nicholas. Arya had grown up with the thought that she would be the one to rule beside the king. She looked quite irritated at the moment and didn't bother to look for this human's stupid kerchief. On the other hand, 
Nicholas didn't help Alexis to look for the kerchief. Instead, he stood with his hands in his pockets, looking at the girl who bit her bottom lip as her eyes searched the floor. Are you sure you dropped it here? Nicholas said to her. The man knew precisely what Alexis was searching for, and it wasn't her handkerchief. It must have been taken away during the time of painting. Alexis wondered if one of the servants had found it, and that it would be returned to her tomorrow. She was the only lady walking around the castle, apart from Ari and Al. Upon hearing about the painting, Arya said, Cousin Nicholas, what were you painting earlier? You said you would show it to me later. I don't think those were my words, corrected Nicholas, and Arya smiled. Of course, I've wanted to look at your paintings, especially the one you created today, responded the vampiress who was eager to see what had caused this human to walk the halls with the king's coat around her body. Alexis didn't want anyone to look at it. God forbid that such a painting would come out in public, where there would be nothing but ill rumors about her involving the king. She wasn't the kind of woman to present herself lewdly in front of others. Nicholas said to Alexis, who had turned pale, Lady Arya is asking to take a look at the painting. Why was he asking her when he knew she didn't want anyone to see it? He then added, It's still a work in progress. Once it's done, I'll have it brought to court for everyone to see. Alexis gave him a pleading look. Was he serious right now? It was hard to tell if he was testing or teasing her, or if he was being sincere. Arya wanted to see the painting, so she decided to have a look at it later. The vampiress was talking about something to Nicholas, while Alexis searched and was just about to give up when she heard a soft, deep voice behind her. You won't get what you're looking for, sweet girl, came the whispered words of Nicholas, who had left Arya to admire one of his recent paintings. Alexis turned her head to meet his dark eyes and his lips, which curved upward into a wicked smile. Why do you say that? She asked him softly. Silly thing. It's because I have it. A Stolen Souvenir Alexis's brown eyes glanced at Arya, who was busy inspecting the paintings, and Alexis looked back into Nicholas's eyes, which were filled with amusement. Swallowing softly, she asked him, Do you mean you have it? It was hard to keep her head straight at the thought that the piece of fabric was in his possession now. It? asked Nicholas ready to twist her words around, which he enjoyed as much as seeing those pink lips stutter. Alexis pursed her lips and came to realize it was true. The king had it. And she didn't know how it came to be with him, but the most decent thing for him to do was to return it to the person to whom it belonged. In this case, she was the owner. Could you please return it to me? asked Alexis, but in response, she heard Nicholas chuckle, and her eyebrows furrowed. How can I give it to you, when what you're looking for isn't that, but your handkerchief? stated Nicholas to the point. He put his hands into the pockets of his trousers, and continued to look at her, with a small, subtle smile, as if he was enjoying the moment. It was true that Alexis had spoken about a missing kerchief, but when he knew she was looking for it, it was unfair how he was making her search for something he had already picked up. Nicholas leaned forward to put his lips against her ear, as if he didn't care if Arya were to return and witness their current closeness. 
How careless of you to drop something like that in the middle of the castle. Careless people don't get the right to keep things. His breath was warm against the shell of Alexis's ear, and she quickly stepped away from him, with her face turned red. She was worried that Arya had seen them, but the vampiress was in her own world. You can't keep things that don't belong to you, Alexis whisper shouted, and saw his lips twist. Watch me keep it, he replied, and Alexis's heart sank in her chest. With the amount of anxiety that he made her feel, she doubted she had ever felt so much of it in her entire life. What was he even going to do with her garter? He was a man, and not a woman, so why steal it from her? Alexis closed her eyes, trying to calm her heart, when she heard him say, You have a reactive heart, and it's good to see how much my words affect you. But then you wouldn't want Arya to know that it wasn't the kerchief you were looking for, but something that was on your thigh, holding those stockings snugly. A wicked smile appeared on his lips when Alexis stared into Nicholas's eyes. She hadn't dropped the garter anywhere on the floor, but Nicholas had taken it from her when she had turned while she was sleeping on the couch in the afternoon. With the hem of her petticoat having moved up to her thigh, it had left one side of her thigh exposed to his view, where the stockings rode up her leg to show the frilly and lacy garter. What are you going to do with it? asked Alexis, because she didn't find any actual reason for him to keep it in his possession. Keep it as a souvenir, was his simple reply. At the same time, Arya had turned around to see her cousin and the human standing in front of each other. Souvenir? asked Arya, who hadn't heard the brief conversation that had taken place just behind her. Alexis didn't want Nicholas to speak out loud about their conversation, so she gave him a quick look and turned to Arya to say, I was saying how I would get a souvenir for everyone here, if I go back home. There are a lot of things that one might find nice at the village market that people might like here. Arya rolled her eyes. I don't know what goods would be there that people like us haven't seen yet. Maybe if I go there tomorrow, I can buy some for the king. Alexis replied choosing her words carefully, and she saw how the smile on Nicholas's lips faltered while his eyes continued to be fixed on her. Alexis knew she wasn't supposed to test Nicholas, but he was being difficult and doing things that were embarrassing her by taking away things that didn't belong to him. He was the one who spoke about a souvenir, and she had only continued to talk about it. The vampiress shook her head. I definitely don't want any part of it. No offense, but I've seen the people there. God, it's so crowded and sweaty. I mean, I didn't go there, obviously, she said, laughing as she laid her hand on her chest. I heard it from Lady Jules. She said the market looks like animals going back and forth. So, no thank you. Nicholas then said, If you want something, you just have to ask. That's what I did, thought Alexis to herself when it came to the fabric. I'll have Paul or someone go get it for you. Alexis had never met anyone like Nicholas before, which was why she couldn't just ignore him apart from his being the king. He did things that pushed her buttons, and expected her to stay put without reacting. But the truth Alexis didn't know was that Nicholas pushed and tested her because he liked to see those reactions from her. Arya had wasted her time on the human, which she wouldn't have done if it weren't for Nicholas being there. 
She glanced briefly around the gallery to find the handkerchief, which wasn't there. She asked Alexis, Do you remember where else you might have dropped it? Alexis, who now knew where the garter was, shook her head. I'll look for it in my room. The vampiress rolled her eyes at that. I guess we can all stop looking then, she said, turning to Nicholas to say, We can ask the tailor to get some new ones made for her. That way she wouldn't have to worry about a single piece of handkerchief. I've asked Paul to summon the tailor to have some clothes made. I'll have him mention that as well. Hearing Nicholas's casual response, Alexis's eyes turned wide with fear. No, Alexis claimed, catching both of them by surprise. The last thing she wanted was to have James brought back here to the castle to stand in front of the king. Ending the Hunt I think Lady Alexis doesn't know how to behave around our dear king. Do you even know what your refusal means? Asked Arya, who stepped forward to cross her arms, looking down at Alexis. You must be taking the king's words too lightly. The vampiress was about to continue when Nicholas raised his hand a clear indication for her to stop speaking. It wasn't as if Alexis didn't know what it meant by refusing the king's help, because it was considered rude. But this time it was James's life at stake here, and she couldn't stay quiet while the king called him to the castle and did something unspeakable. She saw how Nicholas's eyes bored into her. Can you explain why you don't want the newly made handkerchiefs? They'll be made of the finest silk. Asked Nicholas, even though he knew exactly why she said no. Alexis didn't want to ask if the king was still furious about her lying about James, as she had tried to protect the man she shared affections with. Arya stood there with her eyebrows raised, waiting for Alexis to speak. While Nicholas's gaze didn't falter, Alexis said, There are some in a drawer in my room I can make use of. The handkerchief I was looking for was just something I had picked for myself in the past, which was why I wanted to find it. I'll just use the others. It's just a handkerchief, Arya said, shaking her head. As Nicholas and Arya walked out of the gallery, Alexis followed, glaring at the back of his head. When they parted at the end of the corridor, Arya was the one to leave Nicholas and the human, as she had been given a guest room, unlike Alexis's room, which was part of the king's quarters. Nicholas and Alexis walked toward their quarters quietly, with only the sounds of their shoes clicking against the floor. They hadn't gone far, when she was the first one to break the silence. Where is it? She asked him. The king paused when she stopped, turning to her with a puzzled look. Where's what? Alexis's lips pursed tightly as she tried to get the words out of her mouth. My garter. The baffled expression on Nicholas's face changed and he stared at her. Didn't I say it was a souvenir? Something to remember you by? I'm already here. You don't have to steal. Alexis stopped speaking when Nicholas took a step in front of her. Can't do that. It's impolite. What about the painting? She demanded. You said you'd already painted something. That should be punishment enough. No one in their right mind would take an unmarried girl. The king replied quietly, Earn it then. Alexis blinked at his response. What? Take it from me. If you are a good girl, I'll think about returning it to you. Until then, 
it stays with me. Safe. Nicholas said. He was the definition of evil in Alexis's mind. By the time she had come to know the man, she knew he had no intention of returning it, which was similar to the freedom that would never be granted to her. She stared into his red eyes for a long moment, only to have him stare back. Lies, she whispered. Nicholas's eyes softened a little, and he said, Why do you try when you know then? In the hope that one day my side of the bargain would win, she answered, and his lips twisted into a crooked smile. Hope is only good when you're uncertain about something, and a king is never uncertain about what he wants, stated Nicholas. He took a step toward their quarters and added, Go to sleep, sweet girl. Tomorrow's going to be an exciting day. Alexis was worried about tomorrow. Is it true that you've summoned James to the castle? Nicholas sighed, tilting his head to the side. Am I not supposed to ask my tailor to come take my and other men's measurements? If it was going to be just about clothes... Alexis wouldn't have been worried, but she didn't know what Nicholas had on his mind. The king had found it too convenient to require James's presence tomorrow. Don't do anything to him. He hasn't done anything, and he's a good man, she pleaded softly. But her words, instead of appealing to him, only added fuel to the anger that had only simmered down in the evening. But Nicholas didn't show it. Instead, he smiled at her, a smile that was unnerving to Alexis. You think the worst of me. I'm hurt. Alexis tore her gaze away. The last time something happened, you cut off the man's head in front of me. My bad, he replied casually. Alexis blinked at his response. What do you want me to say, that I'm sorry? Asked Nicholas, who had little to no remorse for beheading the man. You surely didn't expect me to let the man go without giving him a decent punishment, now did you? Not when he was speaking to you in such a tone. Don't worry, I won't harm the poor man tomorrow. Alexis wasn't so sure about that. She would only know the truth when James and Nicholas met at the castle tomorrow. Eager or Fear It was to be assumed that Alexis was living a life of riches. After all, the king was courting her, and it made her question how happy another girl would be if it weren't her in the current position. Girls, or women like her elder sister Maggie, would have been happy. Her sister had been overjoyed that the king had taken a liking toward her when they had received the invitation to the ball. But Alexis had stolen the limelight and the king's attention from Maggie, which made her wonder if her sister was still angry about it. Alexis had no control over what had happened, and she had tried to explain it to her sister. She missed her and her parents. To Alexis, Maggie was her sister, her friend, someone whom she deeply cared for and loved no matter what. Alexis took off the dress that she wore and put on her nightgown. Picking up the hairbrush that was lying on the dressing table, Alexis started to untangle her hair, by running the brush from one side of her head to the other. She let out a shuddering breath. She was worried and nervous. Every fiber of her being quaked at the thought of what was going to happen tomorrow. After Nicholas had finished painting her, she had thought that he might let the matter drop, but she should have known better. The King of Devon was a petty man, and he would go to any length to make a statement. That night, 
Alexis barely slept, and she kept tossing and turning in her bed, trying to imagine all the possibilities of what tomorrow could bring. When morning arrived, Alexis had a light headache in the back of her head, and she looked tired. Even with a comfortable bed and a quiet room, she couldn't fall asleep, worrying about what was going to happen to James today. When she did fall asleep for a scant few minutes, she had dreamt of Nicholas holding an axe in his hands, and James, who lay bound on the scaffold as Nicholas raised the axe, which had woken her up. Rubbing her temples, Alexis pushed away from the bed covers and started to get ready. If James was going to arrive early, it was better to be at court than to have the king deal with him before she had an opportunity to do anything. Nicholas's eyes were quick to glance toward the entrance of the court to see Alexis, who had woken early and gotten dressed. Good morning, Alexis. I didn't know you'd be eager to see me today that you've readied yourself faster than any time since you've been here. Alexis didn't have the energy to retort, nor did she forget her manners in front of the king. She stopped immediately and bowed her head to pay her respects. Good morning, King Nicholas, she replied. She noticed how Nicholas turned toward Paul to say something, and then dismissed him. Paul bowed his head at Alexis to greet her, and even though she was upset with the man for telling the king what he had seen, she returned his bow as he walked past her. It looks like I don't have to worry about Paul holding your interest at in the castle, noted Nicholas, his hand going to support the side of his face as his elbow rested on one arm of the throne. Alexis didn't know what the king was hinting at, and he added, You glared at Paul. Alexis frowned and said, No, I didn't. This made Nicholas smile, his lips smiling broadly and his eyes shining with mirth. Altogether, the expression was somewhere between scary and daunting to her. You must be upset that he told me about your little meeting that took place yesterday, said Nicholas, his words echoing in the courtroom, with no one there except for the two of them. Am I wrong? No, the king was never wrong, and Alexis had the urge to say yes, but then she would only look like an insolent child. She didn't even understand what he liked about her. Was it her face? There were many girls and women of the higher class from his status that he could pick. Daughters of lords or dukes or minister. He could have any of them who were more beautiful than her. What time is the tailor going to come? Asked Alexis. And she noticed how the smile on Nicholas's lips twisted in amusement. Eager, aren't we? He asked her, Did you wake up early so that you wouldn't miss meeting him? I thought you weren't going to summon him back to the castle, she answered. Nicholas stared at her with a constant, maddening smile that made Alexis want to know what was going on in his head. But for a few seconds, he just continued to look at her as her nerves only became more frayed. Nicholas took his hand away from his face, and he leaned back against the throne. Staring at her quizzically, he said, Why are you worried? Didn't I say he's the castle's tailor man? I don't know what's making you nervous. Come here. For a second or two, Alexis felt as if her feet were glued to the floor and she had to push herself to start walking to stand in front of him. Closer, said Nicholas, when there was still a reasonable distance between them. When Alexis took two steps forward, the king still wasn't satisfied, and he said, Closer still. Alexis wondered if the king wished for her to sit on his lap, and she wanted to glare at him, 
but he would know that too. Cooling her expression, Alexis took one step farther as her body touched the armrest of the throne where he was seated. Nicholas and Alexis stared at each other, her brown eyes gazing intensely while his dark red ones were calm and unaffected. Just then, Nicholas's hand reached Alexis's face to surprise her. He ran his thumb just below her eyes and murmured, It looks like you barely slept last night.